I'm Ellis Martin. Join me for a conversation with Craig Shesky, the CFO of The Metals Company, trading on the NASDAQ as TMC. The Metals Company is an explorer of lower impact battery metals from seafloor polymetallic nodules on a dual mission. One, to supply metals for the clean energy transition with the least possible negative environmental and social impact. And two, to accelerate the transition to a circular metal economy. The Metals Company, through its subsidiaries, holds exploration and commercial rights to three polymetallic nodule contract areas in the clarion Clipperton zone of the Pacific Ocean. Regulated by the International Seabed Authority, sponsored by the governments of Nauru, Kiribati, and the Kingdom of Tonga. Go to the company's website, metals.co. Craig, welcome back to the program. It's very nice to visit with you today. Thank you, Will. It's my pleasure. Polymetallic nodules in the sea, batteries in a rock. Tell us all about the company and where you're headed with nickel production, hopefully. That's right. Look, we are developing what mining.com has recognized as the number one and number two largest undeveloped nickel projects in the world. These are C4 polymetallic nodules. So people talk about this category as deep sea mining, but it is very different than mining on land. And frankly, our view, and increasingly those who have looked deeper into the space, is that it's actually lower impact because these nodules sit unattached on top of the sea floor. They're not buried, so there's no digging or blasting or drilling. So we are collecting this resource that has four key metals, including nickel, copper, cobalt, and manganese, all of which are now on the U.S. Geological Survey list of critical metals. So we have 1.6 billion tons of this resource in two of our three contract areas, which is obviously very big. It's an order of magnitude larger than any of these other undeveloped nickel projects in the world. And it's something that we can bring online in a time frame to actually matter. Because obviously on land, it'll take take 15 years plus in many cases to go from a discovery of a new nickel mine into production. And we expect to be in production now with our new laid out timeline just over two years in the fourth quarter of 2025. So a very exciting time to be getting into this resource and telling people about how they might be able to invest in it. You're literally scooping up rocks without any real environmental impact at all. Is that correct? Well, I wouldn't go so far. I mean, every extractive industry does have some environmental impact. And, and the question is how much and relative to other ways of getting these metals, because we need these metals full stop for the clean energy transition. If they're not coming from the seafloor resource, they will come from somewhere else. And oftentimes that means a lot of carbon intensity per ton of these metals. It means deforestation, tailing, solid waste, and importantly, impact on local communities, because this is a resource that is very deep and it's very far off shore, and it's in international waters, so it's not in anybody's backyard. And a lot of the social impact that come along with cobalt or nickel production, this resource doesn't have that. So I wouldn't say there's no impact. What we are beginning to find, however, is that the impact of collecting these nodules is something that can be managed and mitigated. And frankly, it's quite a bit lower than most forms of these metals on land. And two specific impacts that people focus on are the plume or the dust cloud that gets picked up. So you're picking these nodules up kind of like a large vacuum cleaner, and it does pick up a little bit of dust. And those who are against this industry will have you believe that that may travel for thousands of miles, that dust cloud. And what we're now seeing from peer-reviewed research, including some from MIT, and we're looking forward to putting out our own research on this in the next few weeks. We shared a bit of it on our conference call last week. What we're finding is that that dust cloud stays very close to the seafloor and settles generally around the test area within a day. So even the impacts that are here, they are manageable and certainly much lower impact relative to where you would have to go on land to get these metals. So this may be a stretch here, but it basically has the same impact as fishing, maybe less. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. I mean, there is, you know, a lot of impact from fishing through a practice like trawling and trawling every year impacts 175 times more seafloor than nodule collection would, let's say in 20 years time. So oftentimes people, of course, have a emotional reaction to the ocean and the idea of mining in the ocean sometimes could be at odds with each other. But the reality is there's already a lot of commercial activity in the ocean. Of course, there's dipping, they're crawling, they're dredging. There's also offshore wind, which frankly, offshore wind would affect much more seafloor per year than seafloor mining. So I think people have to keep in mind the scale that we're talking about. This is not opening up the whole world's oceans to mining. In fact, the clearing Clipperton zone, the areas under exploration within it are less than half of 1% of the world's ocean. And within that small little patch, there is 3.2 times more cobalt, 1.8 times more nickel, 1.2 times more manganese than all known land reserves combined. So there is a scale question that needs to be answered here. And here the scale is very large in terms of the metal that it can produce, but the scale is actually quite small in terms of the amount of ocean 
that would be impacted? I would think with the amount of impact or the lack of impact compared to other methods of, let's say, mining, that you'd have a lot of cooperation and impetus from Congress to move this along and to assist companies like yours. Yeah, it's been an increasing area of focus we're seeing from Congress and as well as the White House, frankly, on all both sides of the aisle are focusing on this. And while there are certainly people on both sides of the debate, we've now seen tangible action from the U.S. Congress. In fact, in July, there was a passage of the U.S. House version of the National Defense Authorization Act. And what that did was basically direct the Pentagon to deliver a report on how the U.S. can catch up on critical metals. But of course, the U.S. has been falling behind to China in terms of the processing and refining of critical metals. And one of the key areas of focus is what can the U.S. do to encourage and incentivize building up a supply chain to allow for the processing and refining of polymetallic nodules on the seafloor? That was followed up in late July by a letter from nine Congress people to the White House, as well as the Pentagon, demanding action on this issue. So a lot of the debate in the media on this topic tends to focus on the environmental impact. And that's something we're learning a lot about. And frankly, that's all pointing in the right direction for us. But there's also a national security aid. They're talking about four critical minerals and for nickel, manganese, and cobalt, the United States effectively had zero or de minimis primary production of all three of those. And that's for right. nickel, manganese, cobalt, and NMC battery chemistry. That's not a good place to be for the clean energy transition to be solely dependent on Chinese supply. And a company like TMC from our contract areas alone could bring the U.S. metal independent. It would be very sad if U.S. had to give up hard-fought energy independent for metal dependent, and we don't think they have to do that. Just a question. I understand a lot of processing happens in China for minerals mined all over the world because there's just not enough processing plants in the West and maybe even Southeast Asia. So, of course, I'm curious about offtake with regard to the metals company. What have you got lined up in that area? Are there enough processing facilities in the world to handle all the resource that you have? It's a great question. And the answer is yeah. And this is one of the great things about our resource in that unlike on land where typically the resources you're going after, particularly for nickel and copper, these are metals we've been mining as humanity for thousands of years. And you go after the higher grade metals first, right? You go after the higher grade resources first. And now you're having to go to more far flung location, deeper into a desert or deeper into a rainforest to find the metals that you need. And that means you have to bring the infrastructure with you. You have to build power plants. You have to build rail roads. You have to build clean water facilities. You have to build local communities or in some cases, move local communities to access the resource. This is a situation where, because nodules are just picked up off the seafloor and then offloaded while at sea to a bulk carrier, that's a continuous mining system. The bulk carrier can take these nodules wherever the infrastructure already exists. Let's use nickel as an example. The largest nickel producing country in the world is Indonesia. A few years ago, Indonesia made the decision to stop the export of raw nickel to encourage China, who is mainly the country investing in Indonesia because China wants that offtake. China wants as much nickel as they can get their hands on. Indonesia made a decision to say, okay, we'll stop exporting raw nickel. China, you, and anybody else who wants this material has to build processing capabilities within the Indonesian border. So that set off an interesting dynamic where there were a lot of RKEFs, rotary kiln electric arc furnaces. That's the type of line that we need to process these nodules. There was a lot of RKEF capacity in South Korea. Japan, China, Malaysia, that no longer had feedstock because Indonesia had said, sorry, you're going to have to build that capacity in country. So this has set up a great dynamic for TMC. Not only is it a CapEx light approach to offshore, where we're taking existing drill ships to collect these nodules, but then you take it to a place onshore where there's an existing processing facility. So that dynamic is something that we're absolutely taking advantage of. On the offtake question, we do have an offtake to Glencore for half of the nickel and copper produced in our Nori area. That's our first project area. And that, of course, is if we are processing at a TMC Ellis facility. So there are some nuances to that contract that could make some of that available. But we will continue to have discussions, not only with automakers, but with PCAM, precursor material companies, battery makers. There are a lot of people who are interested in getting their hands on such a scalable, high-grade source of this material. With regard to mining the resource itself, I'm thinking retrofitting ships. Is that going to be part of your strategy? Will it be easy to upscale the fleet more or less and contract out a lot of the work? It's something that we clearly intend to do to retrofit these ships. And when I say we, I mean our partners offshore, because there is an established industry like our partner Ulti is a part of in the offshore oil and gas space. 
that have these drill ships that can be quite easily repurposed for nodule collection. There are several dozens of these vessels that are moored up in various places around the world that frankly don't have as much to do today. And in the coming decade, that XF supply issue, we think will only increase. So we're able to take these ships and have them retrofitted, but it's not PMC necessarily buying the ships and paying for the retrofitting. We consider ourselves to be the developers of this large resource and taking it over the course of a decade from exploration phase into exploitation phase. And that's where our core competency is, identifying the resource, permitting it, doing all of the environmental work. There is an established industry that's happy to step in and say, we would gladly, for a day rate, a per ton fee, any sort of structure that you're talking about, we would gladly collect the nodules for you and take them to shore for an agreed upon rate. So that's something we intend to do. And again, that's firmly in line with our capital light approach. Now, Ulsees, our partner, is not alone in this. Transocean, the U.S. company, has devoted a drill ship to the space, to the Belgian contractor for nodule collection in the clearing Clipperton zone. There have also been public statements from several other offshore oil and gas companies, and that include Oil State, Stena, Saipem, Technique. So there are a lot of other eyes that are focused on this space, and it's really you know, mainly from the offshore oil and gas industry. This is fascinating. As the CFO of the company, you're daily aware of expenditures as far as cash is concerned. So where is most of the money going that you're raising right now? And how are you raising that money? The twofold question here, is it equity? Explain how you're raising capital, how you're burning it, and who your partners are in that area. Yeah, absolutely. And and we're very fortunate to have some of our most committed and largest shareholders actually being our partners, such as Alsi. Our single largest shareholder, Andre Karkar, also participated in the last capital raise that we announced last week, as did Alsi. So it's another round that we've done, mainly led by existing shareholders. There are some new shareholders that were in that round. There are existing institutional investors who have participated and shown their support again. And that was a transaction where we raised $27 million with potential to upside that to $38 million at effectively an 82% premium to the prior day's closing price. So we raised money at $2 a share, which even today is close to 80% higher than where our current share price is. That's a very rare type of transaction in this market, but the people who are with us and continue to be with us in this long haul, they're not playing for a dollar or $2 or $3. They're playing for many multiples higher than that. And that's why we have the show of support in terms of that transaction. We announced that after the July meeting of the International Seabed Authority, and that's the regulatory body that first delivered the exploration regime for this area and now is expected to deliver an exploitation regime. After their July meeting, they laid out a new timeline, a new roadmap. TNC then announced, okay, we will react to that roadmap. We can work within that construct. And now we'll be in a position to launch our application to begin commercial work following the July 2024 session. And assuming that it's about a one-year review period for us to get our contract to begin commercial operation, we will begin commercial operations in the fourth quarter of 2025. To go from where we were at the time we made that announcement until making the application to begin work after the July session next year, we announced that we would need an incremental 60 to $70 million. Then we announced this transaction where we're raising somewhere between 27 million and 38 million. So there's still a chunk left north of 30 million, let's say, but we have a lot of options in the next year to raise that funding. And we wouldn't anticipate that it's going to be through doing another equity deal, even though the equity deal we did was that significantly above market terms. We have a lot of other options, including asset level financing, earnings, stake sale, prepayments on offtake arrangements, royalties, streaming deals, and potentially government funding. Because as we know, this has been increasingly in the limelight for media in the last couple of months. I would say with a raise at $2 at your current share price being 80% discount from that, that this is a potentially a great entry point for new investors to become part of your company. Many raises, when they're done, they're either at market or slightly less than market. And I think that's really risky. So you've mitigated a lot of potential risk for investors, newer investors, I should say. Yeah, look, at dilution for existing shareholders is extremely important. And obviously, that's very close to our heart. I participated in the transaction. Our CEO participated in the transaction. And, you know, even though we're not happy with the share price is now post-transaction, we are happy to raise that money at much less dilution than the market typically would have dictated. Certainly for any new shareholders who are looking around this idea, I think they should recognize that this is a very, very big resource. The underlying net present value of which is measured in the tens of billions of dollars. And yet you're talking about a market cap, it's several hundred million dollars. And there is a disconnect there. And as we get closer to production and people become more 
familiar with this new segment, we'll trade on the fundamental value of that asset because that asset is there. We can see it. We've shown we collected it. We've shown that we're able to process it as well. So we're just waiting for that final piece of the regulatory puzzle, which, by the way, the regulator is legally mandated to deliver. This isn't a question of them saying, yeah, do we really want to do deep sea nozzle collection or not? That was decided decades ago. The dual mandate of the International Seabed Authority is to deliver first an exploration code and then an exploitation code. So these aren't countries sitting around saying, should we do this or shouldn't it? It's just finally crossing the T's and dotting the I's on that final mining code, which by the way, is in pretty good shape. It first came out in 2015. They were on the fourth draft in 2019 and they intend to consolidate the text in advance of this November reading in 2023. So they're really rounding the third base here on getting this done. What kind of milestones can we see coming into the fall? Well, I expect several milestones. At first, you're going to see increased amount of environmental data, the culmination, really the fleet being born from our work over the last decade. And a lot of the environmental data has already started to come out with respect to biodiversity impact, with respect to the plume impacts that I mentioned earlier, kind of that dust cloud that gets kicked up when you collect nodules. The initial results are very encouraging to us. And we think underpin the idea that nodule collection certainly can be done very responsibly and at a much lower impact than land-based sources of these metals. So that's going to be, I think, an increase a cadence of scientific support. That's also going to lead to increased certainty on the regulatory front, because you have another meeting from the ISA regulator this November. There's going to be another one in March. There's going to be another one in July. So I think what you saw in terms of trading in our stock over the last couple of months there were a lot of retail investors who perhaps were expecting the ISA to give a green light or a red light, a binary thumbs up or thumbs down on this industry. That's never been our expectation. It's always going to be sort of incremental progress over the next several meetings. And of course, TMC has said, we are not going to launch our application to begin work until we finish our world-class environmental and social impact assessment. So I think rather than a binary decision, you're going to get an increased confidence on a lot of the scientific work that's coming out. And you should expect that to, frankly, give more people confidence and institutional investors confidence to increase their position. I would also expect more milestones on the Washington, D.C. front. I think you're going to get more catalysts coming and statements coming from real credible voices. I mean, we've already seen a lot of this happening. Not only the Congress people I mentioned who wrote a letter to President Biden on this, but Senator Lisa Murkowski last year, who was writing to the Department of Energy on the potential for seafloor nodules. I think you're going to get more support on that front. You'll probably also get more support from credible people in the offshore space, such as Director James Cameron, who came out last month, the full-throated endorsement of deep sea mining. And his view is, look, I've seen more seafloor than nearly any other human on earth, and it's very barren. It's miles and miles of nothing but clay. And my gosh, I would much rather see mining of the seafloor, which with lower impacts than the alternative, which is child labor cobalt from the DRC or potentially rainforest destruction with respect to nickel in Indonesia. And I thought that was a very lucid and brave response. And you also had a very similar response from The Economist, which came out with three articles in July, imploring the world to think about sea floor nodules. And that culminated in an article that said it's time to mine the seabed. So I think the catalysts to look forward to are really on the TMC front, more confidence with our environmental program on the regulatory front. That environmental program is going to lead to more confidence there. And then also, I think you should expect us getting to binding commercial agreement with our offshore and onshore partners by the end of this year. That's quite a lot. I'm certainly glad we spent the time to cover pretty much everything. Every question I had, perhaps our audience has had it as well. And are you available to chat with anybody that wants more information than we've disseminated today? Absolutely. And look, uh, happy to give my email if you'd like, Ellis, but it's craig at metals.co. And if anybody wants to reach out to you directly, I'm happy to set up a conversation. It's a new space. There are a lot of questions to it, I know, but at the end of the day, the resource is the resource. And that resource is the largest and second largest nickel project in the world. And this is coming a lot quicker than I think most people realize. Craig, it's always great to catch up with you. I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks for joining me today on the program. Thank you, Ellis. I appreciate it. I've been speaking with Craig Shesky, the CFO of The Metals Company, trading on the NASDAQ as TMC. Go to the company's website, metals.co. I'm Ellis Martin. Would you like to be one of the first to see who we are following? Subscribe to our audio newsletter. It's free. EllisMartinReport.com.